Bon, sans plus attendre, j'appelle à me rejoindre Quentin Tarantino. Thanks everybody. You guys were a great audience. Merci, vous avez été un super public. Let me just ask a question first. How many uh, uh, raise your hand if you hadn't seen the film before? Si vous n'aviez jamais vu le film. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a lot of satisfied customers judging from your response. On dirait qu'on a plein de clients satisfaits là du coup. Alors Quentin, on va parler de du film de John Film dans un instant, mais d'abord, qu'est-ce que représentait pour vous justement à l'époque la quinzaine des réalisateurs? What did the Fortnite represent to you at the time? Oh, um, I just had the whole uh, 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 legend of it about being like that's that's the place where uh, directors who did their first film. It's the first film you could go anywhere. People could accept you or reject you, but if Khan saw you and invited you, having only made one movie, to Khan and being played in that venue, that would be you know, that you know that was you were discovered. <laughs> You were discovered, and not by uh, like you know uh, some newspaper movie critic, but by the international film scene. Alors euh, que je sache exactement ce que c'était ou pas, en tout cas la légende qui entourait la quinzaine pour moi, c'était que c'était là qu'on pouvait montrer aussi beaucoup des premiers films et que si on était invité ici, euh, voilà, on pouvait être découvert et pas seulement par des critiques, mais par la scène euh, de cinéma international. Voilà, la chose est réparée. Bienvenue à la quinzaine des cinéastes. Now it's fixed. Welcome to the Directors Fortnite. Thank you very much. <laughs> Makes it all the sweeter. Thank you. Du coup, ça a un goût encore meilleur. Alors, revenons au film de John Flynn. Um, dans Cinema Speculation, vous dites que c'est le film qui vous a autorisé à devenir critique de cinéma, à écrire sur les films. Uh, vous aviez 19 ans. Euh, c'est la première fois que vous décidiez, vous osiez aller à la rencontre d'un cinéaste, l'interviewer. Quentin a cherché dans l'annuaire tous les John Flynn de Los Angeles. Il, a, il les a appelés les uns après les autres et il est tombé sur le bon John Flynn qui a accepté de l'interviewer. Ici en France, John Flynn n'est pas forcément un cinéaste très connu parmi les cinéphiles. Est-ce que vous pouvez nous représenter un petit peu en quelques mots John Flynn et pourquoi dans votre jeunesse, c'était un cinéaste qui comptait tellement pour vous. So we just, just watched the movie that gave you permission to be a critic, as you say in your book. You say that for this film, for the first time at the age of 19, you took the liberty to seek out a filmmaker. You looked him up in the phone book and you met and interviewed him. Can you tell us about John Flynn, who is very little known here in France, and tell us what makes him one of the first directors you became so fond of? Yeah, uh, I can. Um, and just one thing regarding this movie it's it was uh, it was the film that I felt that I had discovered that other people didn't really know about unless you just happened to have seen it uh, uh, when it came out but then it was also one of those things where as it went on I realized there actually was a bit of a cult following for it and the people who saw it and loved it it was actually one of their favorite movies but you, they, you had we had no way of getting in touch with each other or or conversing back and forth back in the 70s about that you would just hear about uh, somebody who saw it and liked it but uh, but it was the movie that kind of made me start uh, taking myself seriously as uh, as a film critic to some degree even though I wasn't really writing it down and uh, yeah I would I would see it and I would see it again and I would see it again and not just for the action scenes or not just for the the audience payoff scenes even though that was always fun but it was always interested to see how this audience responded to it how that audience responded to it uh whenever we watched it with a room full of people like this we always got response very similar to what what we got tonight but you know but I would watch it with an audience of you know 15 people I'd I'd watch it with an audience of six people in there and it was interesting to see how they react 
Euh, eh bien, en fait, euh, je pensais euh, au début avoir, avoir découvert un peu une pépite, hein, euh, mais euh, plus le temps a passé et plus j'ai entendu dire que ce film devenait culte, euh, et, sauf qu'à l'époque, on n'était pas vraiment en contact, les gens ne se parlaient pas autant qu'aujourd'hui, euh, mais c'est ce qui m'a permis de me prendre au sérieux en tant que critique. Et donc, plus je le regardais, enfin, j'allais le voir dans différents endroits, à différents moments, et euh, les, les scènes euh, que, qui sont les scènes d'action, les scènes qui sont gratifiantes pour le public, il y avait euh, des réactions un peu similaires à, à la vôtre, qu'il y ait 15 personnes dans la salle, 6 ou bien au plus encore. But it was also one of those things where uh, the more I gave to the movie, the more it gave back to me, the more I was able to see aspects of the character that both uh, Schrader and Harold Gould, uh, Haywood Gould wrote, and but, but particularly William Devane's performance of it. Um, You know, at a certain point, I started realizing similarities about this or that character moments. I started realizing, you know, he doesn't really give a fuck about the wife anymore. You know, it's uh, his revenge is about his son. He's kind of making that pretty clear. Yeah. <laughs> Euh, et, bien, et en fait plus euh, je donnais de temps et de, 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 je me consacrais à ce film plus le film me rendait des choses en retour je découvrais des aspects euh, aussi des choses euh, qui, avaient été, euh, qui venaient de l'écriture de Paul Schrader et de, de la réécriture de Haywood Gould et aussi de la performance de William Devane et je remarquais voilà, des, des, des parallèles des choses, des similarités et en fait je me suis rendu compte qu'à un moment euh, il s'en fout vraiment de sa femme et qu'en en fait il va juste venger son fils et puis juste des petites choses comme, well, you know, il va aller go and get revenge with this shotgun, this is what he's going to do when he, when he uh, kills all the people in the horror house. Well, that shotgun was given to him by his son as a homecoming present, oddly enough, picked out by Cliff, you know? Uh, yeah, it was, you know so it'd just be all, those, all these kind of things, but like just even having said that, I noticed something here tonight that I had never noticed. Uh, when uh, Linda Forche is in the hospital room before he sees her, And he's just in the hospital bed, and she's like with a pillow, and she's just kind of sitting there. And then when it's time for her to leave, she wants to leave without waking him up. So she, you know, she's quiet as she goes out, but she takes a look at him, and then the covers are kind of messed up. And so she straightens out the covers and, and covers him up a little bit, and then she exits without him waking up. And then at the very end, he ends up doing the exact same thing with her when he's going to now sneak out and go do everything and he's trying to do everything without waking her up but then he sees her covers are not right and he adjusts her covers and then he gets out without wake gets out of the room without waking her up Par exemple, voilà des, des choses qui se répondent dans le film. Quand euh, il va donc tuer tout le monde avec euh, ce fusil mitrailleur, c'est un fusil mitrailleur qui lui a été donné par son fils à son retour. Et c'est un fusil mitrailleur qui a été en fait, choisi par Cliff. Et puis, il y a un détail que j'ai remarqué seulement aujourd'hui, qui est que quand Linda Forcher va le voir à l'hôpital et qu'elle ne veut pas le réveiller, euh, en partant, en fait, euh, elle, euh, elle remet un peu sa couverture, elle le borde un petit peu, elle, euh, elle le recouvre. Et euh, il se passe la même chose à la fin, à l'inverse, où c'est lui qui va qui va se lever sans la réveiller et euh, elle, elle, elle est en train de dormir et donc il, il, la, il la recouvre et remet la couverture bien. And you know, I, I, I mean, and even just trying to describe that scene with a little bit of tenderness right now, like I did, and I almost start getting choked up because you know, um, right now the parts that I find the most moving are the scenes between him and his son, especially since I've become a father, between him and his son, and the scenes between him and her. And normally it's, 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 it's her that, that chokes me up. But that moment when he sneaks out uh, and doesn't wake her up, that's, that's touching coming from his, his side because he just doesn't have anything left to give her. She, she deserves so much better than him. She deserves more than, than any of this. And if he could love her, he would. But he can't. He just can't. All he can do is give her money like you would a whore. Just He has to treat her like a whore at the end because that's all he has. And it's, you know, I think it's sad. 
Et euh, cette scène, aujourd'hui, je la regarde euh, avec tendresse. Et là, ça m'a vraiment mis un petit peu euh, les larmes aux yeux. Et parce que plus, au fur et à mesure que je regarde euh, les, le film, eh il euh, y a des rôles qui m'émeuvent euh, plus ou moins. Et plus je le regarde, plus c'est les scènes entre lui et son fils et les scènes entre lui et elle, Linda, qui m'émeuvent. Et alors que d'habitude, c'est elle qui me touche. Là, je trouve que c'est touchant de sa part à lui de faire ça. Parce que c'est une façon de, de... En fait, il se rend compte qu'il n'a plus rien à lui donner. Euh, parce qu'elle mérite mieux que lui. S'il pouvait l'aimer, euh, il le ferait. Mais tout ce qu'il peut faire, c'est lui donner de l'argent comme une pute. Et en fait, c'est extrêmement triste. Et maintenant, sur uh, uh, John Flynn, uh, il est venu à directer un très, très old façon, un façon qui ne se passe pas beaucoup plus. Mais il y avait une lignée de ça. Il n'a pas venu à directer par être un écrivain ou un éditeur ou quelque chose comme ça. Il est venu de être un premier AD. And first ADs are a little different in America than they are in Europe. They're not really assistant directors. They're, they're there to help the crew and help, they're, they're there to help facilitate um, what the director wants to do. And they kind of are, in, you know, more or less kind of in charge of the crew representing the director. And often, you know, more often than not, if you become a successful first AD, no, you're not going to be a director. That's the thing. You, you, uh, they're almost two different talents. Um, and so once you become a successful direct uh, AD, then you know that's kind of what you are. Et en fait, il est, c'était un peu quelqu'un donc à l'ancienne, hein, John Flynn. Il n'est pas venu de l'écriture ou du montage, par exemple. Lui, il était premier assistant réalisateur, ce qui est un rôle un petit peu différent aux États-Unis euh, par rapport à en Europe. C'est vraiment un facilitateur de l'équipe. Il représente le réalisateur auprès des équipes, mais il n'est pas forcément destiné à devenir réalisateur lui-même. And so there was a time where that was a, a way to get into directing, and you know some of the big directors out there that did that transition were uh, 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 Joseph von Sternberg started off as a first AD, first AD. Robert Aldrich was like considered one of the great first ADs of all time. And then later he became like the head of the director's union because he understood both sides of uh, the labor issue. Um, but John Flynn also, uh, and R Walter Hill was, uh, was a second AD and a first AD. Uh, uh, before too, uh, and actually, John Flynn and Walter Hill were were I don't know if they were best friends, but they were very, 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 very good friends. They I mean, really, really tight. And uh, and John Flynn started off. He was Robert Wise's first AD, first or second, and he worked on a, a whole bunch of Robert Wise. You know, he worked on uh, 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 West Side Story. I think he worked on the Sand Pebbles. Uh, you know, and he worked with a lot of really cool guys. He worked with uh, Phil Carlson when he was doing uh, um, Kid Galahad with Elvis Presley. And he was talking about, yeah, I'm, you know, uh, you know, I'm sitting there in a, a recording studio listen, you know, with Elvis at my disposal, sitting there listening to him record one song after another. And you know, it, to me, it was just a job. But everybody else would, would would have loved to have been there to just listen to Elvis record for like five days straight. Et donc, euh, alors que maintenant, ça n'est plus tellement destiné à devenir euh, voilà, un réalisateur, les premiers assistants, à l'époque, il y a eu des cas comme Robert Aldrich, qui était considéré comme un des meilleurs premiers assistants réels. Et en plus, ensuite, il a dirigé le syndicat parce qu'il comprenait les deux côtés de, de, de la force de travail. Et Walter Hill aussi est un exemple illustre. Euh, Flynn et lui, d'ailleurs, étaient très amis. Et euh, il avait été premier assistant ou deuxième assistant réalisateur de Robert Wise pendant des années, notamment sur West Side Story et aussi sur des films d'Elvis où il était euh, en studio avec Elvis à l'écouter, enregistrer des chansons. And then so, um, uh, so he moved into directing in the uh, early 70s with uh, the uh, um, homosexual uh, melodrama uh, The Sergeant with uh, Rod Steiger, which I remember seeing when I was a kid and not liking it, but if you guys listen to the Video Archives podcast, you'll realize like what huge fans of Rod Steiger uh, uh, we are. So I'm, you know, I'm Into, like, were you watching every Rod Steiger movie now? And especially now, what is such a fan of uh, John Flynn I am. I can't wait to see it again. But uh, that was his first film. Then he did a film that took place in um, uh, uh, Jerusalem called uh, The Jerusalem File with Bruce Davidson, and uh, which I've never seen. It's like one of those really, really hard to find films. That's, I, I've, I've, over the years, I've found most of those hard to find films. That's one of the ones I haven't found yet. But then he did the movie that I think kind of started, you know, officially started. Uh, Uh, his fame for those of us who have liked him and discovered him, and that uh, is his adaptation of Richard Stark's novel, The Outfit, which is basically a sequel to uh, uh, John Borman's Point Blank. 
Et donc, euh, au début des années 70, il a commencé avec un premier film, Le Sergent, un drame homosexuel que je n'ai pas forcément aimé sur le coup, mais qu'aujourd'hui, euh, j'aime beaucoup. Et puis, un film euh, qui s'appelle The Jerusalem File, que je n'ai jamais vu, qui est très difficile à trouver. Et le film qu'il a vraiment lancé, euh, ce qui est considéré comme le film qu'il a lancé, qui s'appelle Échec à l'organisation, qui est une adaptation euh, du livre de Richard, Richard Sark, euh, du même nom, et qui est, la suite, qui est considéré comme la suite du film de John Borman. Et so, just kind of wrap up on John Flynn, is... Uh You know, later in the 80s, he would do a few films, even a couple that you might have might have seen, uh, and some of them that are okay, some of them I like less than others. But you know, to me, his career boils down to three action movies that he did in a row, which I kind of think of as his 70s trilogy, and it's The Outfit with Joe Don Baker and uh, Robert Duvall and Karen Black and Robert Ryan. And then it's Rolling Thunder with this cast. And then he did a third movie, not as good as the other two, but still pretty damn good. All right, an action movie called Defiance uh, that stars uh, uh, Jan Michael Vincent. And it's sort of like, well, it's like a Shane kind of thing. He's like a merchant marine, merchant marine who comes into a South Bronx town where this uh, gang is like terrorizing the neighborhoods and he kind of stands up to them. And it's, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty damn good movie. It's not in the same class as the other two, but it's pretty damn good. And it fits a really nice action film trilogy in the 70s coming from one man. Et ensuite, dans les années 80, il a fait encore quelques films qui sont plus ou moins bons. Mais pour moi, sa carrière se résume essentiellement à trois films qui peuvent être considérés comme une trilogie des années 70 de films d'action. Donc, Échec à l'organisation, Légitime violence, celui-ci. Et un film qui est considéré comme moins bon, mais qui est quand même vraiment pas mal, qui s'appelle Les Massacreurs de Brooklyn, un film de gang, et qui, même s'il ne joue pas dans la même catégorie. C'était la première question. <rire> That was just the first question. Um... Je vais recontextualiser un petit peu ce que Quentin Tarantino dit dans Cinema Speculation à propos du film, puisque donc Rolling Thunder euh, est adapté d'un script de Paul Schrader. Or, euh, vous expliquez dans, dans votre livre que Schrader s'est senti trahi par, par la réécriture du film et par le, le, le résultat final, puisque, comme pour Taxi Driver, Schrader avait écrit un personnage beaucoup plus raciste euh, envers les Mexicains, euh, les Akuna Boys, euh, le gang qui vient le massacrer sa famille et lui euh, broyer la main, euh, au départ était censé être joué par euh, que des acteurs mexicains, et le film par ailleurs était censé se terminer dans un bain de sang encore plus euh, euh, terrible puisque euh, Schrader l'avait pensé comme euh, les deux soldats, euh, les deux vétérans du Vietnam qui reviennent à la maison et qui se recroient encore à la guerre et qui vont absolument tuer tout le monde sans épargner personne. Ce qui a fait dire à Schrader que euh, le film, finalement, était fasciste. Vous, dans le livre, vous lui répondez « Oui, c'est vrai, mais c'est le plus génial des films fascistes. <rire> » Donc, je voulais vous demander est-ce que, euh, pour vous, c'est la dimension cathartique de euh, l'explosion de la violence qui est plus important, qui, euh, qui vous plaît tant dans le cinéma et peut-être dans ce film. The original script for Rolling Thunder was written by Paul Schrader. In your book, you explain why, just like with Taxi Driver, Schrader felt betrayed by the rewriting of the script and by the film. The character should have been more overtly racist towards Mexican, uh, but in, Flim, in Flint's film, the Akuna boys uh, were partly replaced by white men, and the film's ending is less violent than in Schrader's script. Rain and Johnny should have uh, killed everyone in a, venge in a fit of vengeful rage, as if they were still in, at war. And at the end of the chapter, you recognize that the film is fascist, but you go on to say, yet the greatest fascist revenge dramatic fl flick ever made. Can you, uh, so uh, could you say that um, it's the cathartic dimension of the roaring rampage of violence and revenge that you like in films? Well, uh... Yeah, I look. I look. I like violent movies. Is uh... <laughs> people like musicals. Some people like uh, slapstick comedy. Uh, I like violent movies. Uh, uh, I think uh, it's a very cinematic thing to do. I think it's a lot of fun, and. I go and uh, you know it's it's all you know it's all a story. So you just enjoy the story. Paul Schrader like you know doesn't recognize the movie to this day. He doesn't recognize the movie any more than I recognize Oliver Stone's version of Natural Born Killers for many of the same reasons, frankly. You know, uh, uh, 
you know, but some people like that movie, and well, you know, God bless them. You know, Johnny Cash really liked Natural Born Killers, all right? I bumped into him once in an elevator. He goes, hey, uh, me and June, we really love that Natural Born Killers. I didn't tell him he was wrong, all right? <laughs> I was like, well, yeah, well, I'm good. I'm glad, you know? Uh, thanks, Johnny, you know? Um, but, you know, uh, uh, Bestrader and I have talked about it, and, uh, and then he sent me the script, so... And then I really realized why he didn't like it. it, it it's completely different. It, it, it follows the same structure. It tells pretty much the exact same story. But it also has someone like Schrader's best dialogue, and hardly any of the dialogue survives in, in, uh, um, in this version. But, you know, but, but the thing about it is, while it follows the story pretty much to a T, it's a different Charlie. The guy is a different guy. Linda Forche is different. Everybody's fucking different, you know. Even though they all do the same plot functions. Uh, oui, j'aime les films violents, uh, comme d'autres aiment les comédies musicales ou les comédies loufoques. Je trouve que c'est extrêmement cinégénique et ça m'éclate. Mais c'est vrai que uh, Schrader, lui, a renié donc uh, ce film et aujourd'hui encore, hein, uh, tout comme moi, je, je, je n'ai jamais reconnu uh, Turner, uh, la, la version d'Oliver Stone, en partie pour les mêmes raisons. Uh, mais certaines personnes aiment ce film, comme Johnny Cash que j'ai croisé un jour dans un ascenseur et qui m'a dit qu'il avait beaucoup aimé le film et je lui ai pas dit qu'il avait tort. Hein. Uh, donc uh, Schrader m'a je lui ai parlé, il m'a envoyé le scénario et c'est là que j'ai compris pourquoi il n'aimait pas le film, parce que même si la structure et l'histoire sont assez semblables et qu'une partie des meilleurs dialogues ont été conservés et que c'est assez fidèle, les personnages sont très différents, celui de Linda et de, de Rain, même s'ils remplissent les mêmes fonctions, sont très différents. And you know, one of the, you know, one of the things is, the, you know, this was the script he wrote after uh, Taxi Driver, I think Yakuza might have been in there in the middle somewhere, but I think it was these two scripts. And um, and in the case of Taxi Driver, he was writing this vicious, cracked mirror reflection of uh, a vigilante movie, like something like a, a Death Wish, all right? But the, again, a cracked mirror, bizarro world version of it, and uh, where the movie doesn't take the character off the hook for the things he does. And even more popular than Death Wish were you know, the revenge of Maddox that were being made at that time. And it, it, I mean, you know, it was literally like every month, there was like a new one coming out. There was so many you, you, uh, between 74, 75, 76, and 77. You'd open the newspaper, turn on the TV, and, uh, and Peter Fonda in Fighting Mad, or you know, <laughs> turn the dial, Bo Svensson in Breaking Point. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it was just you know, one after another. Et euh, donc ce scénario, il l'a écrit après Taxi Driver et peut-être aussi euh, juste après ou juste avant euh, Yakuza. Yakuza. Euh, et euh, le, le, ce, le scénario de Taxi Driver était un peu un reflet, comme un miroir brisé euh, du, de un justicier dans la ville. Mais là, le genre plus populaire donc de ce qu'on appelle le Revenge of les films de vengeance, euh, il y en avait à l'époque entre 74 et 77, il y en avait des nouveaux euh, tous les mois. Il suffisait d'ouvrir le journal ou d'allumer la télévision. So he writes a Revenge of and sets it up, except he has the character be this like Texas racist. And Linda Fauche is a, is a Texas racist. I mean, they're just racist against Mexicans. They're always making Mexican remarks constantly. And not constantly, but I shitload. And, and um, you know, just like redneck Texans. And, um, and then it turns out the Acuna boys are all Mexican and they, they do what they do, what they do what they do here. And, uh, you know, like here, like, like this movie, you want him to get those fucking guys. You want him to get those fucking guys and kill them. So then the, the movie keeps going on like a regular revenge movie until they get to the climax, when they get to the whorehouse. And so when they get to the whorehouse, pretty much what happens here happens there, except, no, they kill everybody. <laughs> Every, I, it seems like they kill everybody here, but no, no, they kill the whores, they kill the Mexicans that are at there, they kill the customers, they kill fucking everybody. They kill the entire brothel. You know, and that is where Schrader makes his point that these guys are fucking insane. And that is where Schrader makes the point of a, of a cracked mirror bizarro world version of a revenge matic And the movie doesn't do that. <laughs> 
Et euh, donc, euh, il a décidé d'écrire un, un film comme ça de vengeance et euh, c'est sur des, euh, vraiment des, des racistes, des rednecks du Texas euh, qui font énormément de remarques racistes pendant tout le film contre les Mexicains. Euh, et euh, les Hakuna Boys sont tous mexicains et euh, le public veut vraiment qu'il euh, qu les bute tous. Et donc, jusqu'à l'apogée, euh, tout se passe à peu près comme dans le film qu'on vient de voir, euh, jusqu'à l'apogée dans le bordel. Euh, et où là, dans la version de Shredder, il tue absolument tout le monde, que ce soit les prostituées, les Mexicains, les clients, et c'est là que Schrader prouve que vraiment il, il devient complètement fou, ils sont complètement fous, et que euh, vraiment on est, euh, on est dans un, encore une fois dans un monde complètement euh, tordu euh, de miroirs brisés. So, in, so to wrap it up, like in, you know, so in Schrader's words, I wrote a critique of fascist revenge movies, and then they took my critique of fascist revenge movies and made a fascist revenge movie, and I say yes. But the greatest fascist revenge movie. <laughs> Alors moi, Schrader disait qu'il avait donc écrit une critique des films de vengeance fasciste. Il dit qu'on lui a, qu on lui a enlevé des choses et que c'est devenu uniquement un film de revanche fasciste. Mais moi, j'ajoute que c'est quand même le plus génial de tous. Alors ça, ça m'amène à, à parler d'un autre film que, qui, qui, auquel vous consacrez un chapitre entier dans le livre, qui est l'Inspecteur Harry de Dan Siegel. Um, Là aussi, vous recontextualisez le film en disant « Le film a été fait pour un pu le public de la majorité silencieuse, c'est-à-dire la génération euh, des vétérans du Vietnam qui, euh, revenus au pays, ne reconnaissent plus les États-Unis et euh, découvrent un monde de hippies et de euh, Black Panthers qui leur fait très peur. » Et soudain, l'inspecteur Callan vient incarner euh, le justicier blanc qui va euh, les éliminer et les rassurer. Alors, en France, la tradition critique euh, veut que, euh, depuis, euh, depuis euh, les fameux articles de, de Godard, de Rivette, que le travelling est une affaire de morale. Euh, C'est-à-dire que le, le, le jugement moral, d'une certaine manière, prédispose le jugement esthétique sur les œuvres. Et donc, par, euh, par, par voie de conséquence, le, un film comme Rolling Thunder ou L'inspecteur Harry euh, seraient euh, jugés euh, immoraux. J'aimerais euh, connaître votre position là-dessus par rapport à, cette, euh, à ce qui est devenu cette maxime française de la critique. Est-ce que vous, vous êtes plutôt d'accord ou en désaccord Et ou, si vous êtes en désaccord, est-ce que comme Dan Siegel, vous auriez tendance à dire que le plus important est d'abord d'électriser le public So moving on to another film uh, which you um, write a chapter about, Dirty Harry. Um, uh, it was a film that was made to uh, speak to the silent majority, uh, mostly uh, Vietnam veterans who didn't recognize the country anymore, uh, a, a country of hippies and Black Panthers. And so he comes in as a vigilante uh, to uh, face them and uh, reassure the audience. Um, uh, so here in France, Uh, we are marked by a long tradition of film critics, uh, which date back to Godard and Rivet, for whom tracking shots are a question of morality, which is a famous coined phrase. Uh, the moral stance of a filmmaker on what he's filming is an essential point of aesthetic judgment in France. Uh, so um, would you say that, uh, would you agree with that, or would you say, like, just like Don Siegel, uh, you uh, would be more uh, on board with trying to electrify audiences? I'm more on the side of, of, of uh, electrifying audiences, frankly. Uh, the thing about it is, uh, uh, Don Siegel's act has been, he's been pretty expressive about it because he was asked about, especially about Dirty Harry. And he, uh, and he, he was really clear about really kind of not actually understanding the, the way people kept trying to politicize the movie he was trying to make. He felt it was being dragged into a political discussion that maybe Eastwood was a little bit more, had, had more skin in the game as far as that was concerned. But, you know, Don Siegel was like, no, it's a, it's a cop movie and he's after the crazy killer and he's gonna get them. And, uh, you know, I, I wasn't looking at it from a socio-political point of view. It was just a exciting cop picture that I thought we would make, uh, uh, make and audiences would like, and they did. So I don't quite get it. <laughs> Euh, oui, euh, Don Siegel s'est beaucoup exprimé là-dessus et de façon très claire parce qu'il ne comprenait pas qu'on veuille à tout prix politiser son film euh, et qu'on l'entraîne dans, euh, dans ce, ce, ce débat-là. Euh, Peut-être que Eastwood, lui, était plus dans cette veine-là, mais lui, il disait non, non, c'est vraiment un polar. Il n'y a pas de point de vue socio-politique. J'ai juste voulu faire un film que le public aimerait et ça a marché. 
now, now where I'm standing from though, it's more about, look, I'm not, well, look, I'm not in a situation where I'm going to come across some script and go and, and, and do it. I'm, I, I, I write my own material. So if there's political aspects to it in there, I fucking put them in there. All right. So, uh, you, you know, so I'm not going to be quite in the same situation. Uh, of, of oh wow this was a funny comedy and not thought think about what the implications of uh, of uh, uh, of the film are um, so one if I'm doing a script of a movie I wrote well no I'm endorsing it I'm endorsing this point of view uh, that's exactly what I'm doing and now some people can not like that point of view. Some people can misread it, and that happens a lot. And people can write think pieces about what's wrong with the film because of this or that and, there and, and the other. That doesn't make them right. At the same time, it doesn't make them wrong, all right? You know, they can be, they can be completely wrong for, as for where I'm coming from. I can think they're completely full of shit. But if they make their case, it doesn't matter what I was thinking on the day. The case is, can they make their case? Now, oftentimes, I don't think they make a good case. But if they did, well, you know, okay, hats off to them. But that isn't what I was thinking. Et alors, donc moi, dans mon cas, c'est différent parce que petit un, je ne suis pas en situation de tomber sur un scénario et de, de le réaliser puisque j'écris moi-même mes scénarios. Donc, quand il y a des aspects politiques dans mes films, c'est moi qui les y ai mis et j'assume entièrement ce point de vue. Et deuxièmement, euh, on peut ne pas aimer ou mal interpréter ce que j'ai fait, ce qui ne donne pas raison à ces gens-là euh, qui interprètent mal ou qui n'aiment pas pour autant, mais ça ne leur donne pas non plus tort. S'ils argumentent bien, euh, pourquoi pas Moi, je veux bien. Euh, mais là, c'est juste que je trouve que la plupart du temps, euh, l'argumentation n'est pas bonne. But also, I've, I've read negative think pieces where they're da 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 and then they finish, and you know, voila, boom, you know? <laughs> and then I say, well, you say that like it's a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was doing that, and uh, I like that. <laughs> Donc il y a des gens qui écrivent des critiques en pensant m'assassiner, en, en décrivant ce que je fais dans mes films. Et moi, bah, ma réaction, c'est de dire, bah oui, mais vous faites comme si c'était mal de faire ça. Alors qu'en fait, euh, oui, c'est ce que j'ai voulu faire et moi, j'aime bien. Toujours à propos de la violence euh, au cinéma, vous, euh, vous citez euh, euh, votre mère dans le, dans le livre. Euh, elle vous a dit quelque chose qui, 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 a, qui a compté pour vous, que, que vous avez retenu, euh, manifestement. Euh, elle vous a dit un jour, alors qu'elle vous emmenait au cinéma, que euh, la violence au cinéma n'était pas un problème à partir du moment où on comprenait le contexte dans lequel elle s'inscrivait. J'aurais aimé vous demander, euh, quels sont donc les, les contre-exemples, euh, quelques contre-exemples de, de films euh, pour lesquels euh, le contexte n'est pas, euh, pas suffisamment justifié et qui ferait que vous, vous n'aimez pas les films. So your mother once told you something which had a big impact on you about violence, which is that we can absolutely stand violence in images as long as we understand the context in which it occurs. Could you, could you maybe give us some counter examples of this uh, when uh, films were in which violence is not justified enough and so you don't like it? Oh. Uh... Now, yeah, that's interesting. Um, okay, well, the, the one thing, there's something that comes to my mind. There absolutely is something that, that comes to my mind, but it, 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 it's more a moralistic thing than it is, I didn't like the way they did this scene versus that scene, which is what you're asking. But I just, I just have a thing about, um, and they did it in European movies and Asian movies a lot. I have this big thing about killing animals in movies. I just, uh, that's a, a, a bridge I can't cross, you know. Um, but I kind of, but I mean insects too. I mean, uh, uh, I'm not, unless I'm paying to see some weird bizarro documentary, I'm not paying to see real death. You know, part of, the way that this all works is it's make-believe. That's why I can stand by the violent scenes, because we're all just fucking around. We're all just children playing, all right? And it's not real blood, and people don't get really hurt. Sometimes they do, because we're overzealous, but that's not the goal. And, and uh, 
you know, some animal, some dog, some llama, some fly, all right? He doesn't give a fuck about your movie. Some rat, and I don't, I'd, I'd kill, I'd kill a zillion rats. I don't necessarily want to kill one in a movie, and nor do I want to see it die in a movie, because I don't, I don't, I'm not paying to see real death. Alors, c'est plus d'un point de vue moral, ce n'est pas tout à fait votre question, mais euh, moi, c'est quelque chose qui s'est beaucoup fait dans les films européens et asiatiques, mais j'ai du mal, à, j'arrive toujours pas à accepter de qu'on tue des animaux dans des films, et ça vaut aussi pour les insectes, euh, parce que je n'ai pas signé pour euh, voir une vraie mort à l'écran, euh, sauf si j'ai payé pour voir euh, un docu Zarbi euh, sur, sur le sujet. Mais euh, vraiment, je, pour moi, le cinéma, c'est important de, de comprendre qu'en fait, on est là pour faire semblant, qu'on est comme des enfants qui jouent, et que ce soit un chien à la ou une mouche, euh, en fait, euh, voilà, on s'en fout qu'un sale gosse ait envie de, de, de filmer ça, et je, donc je ne paye pas pour voir des vrais morts. And I'm not trying to uh, uh, leap out of your question. I, and, and there's no titles that are necessarily coming to mind. I know I have seen some gruesome horror films that didn't have to be that way, but you know, almost always, it's all, almost always, it's, it's not just the violence that I have a problem with, it's usually badly done. It, there's usually, there's an incompetent factor in there. There's an incompetence, all right? Uh, if it truly stirs me in some way, even in a way that's unpleasant, even in a way that I wish I hadn't seen it, I can't say they, I, 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 uh, uh, that, that does seem like good filmmaking. Et je n'ai pas vraiment de titre en particulier à, à vous citer, mais j'ai vu souvent des films qui étaient vraiment gores de façon qui n'était pas nécessaire. Et à chaque fois, quand j'ai un problème avec la violence, c'est qu'en fait, elle est mal faite, qu'il y a vraiment une notion d'incompétence là-dedans et que, que, que ça ne me plaît pas. Si ça me remue dans le mauvais sens, c'est que ça a été, en fait, pour moi, je pense, mal fait. I got, a, I got an example. I got an example. And, you know, and again, it's not like it, it hit a bunch of buttons about, it didn't hit any moral buttons with me. It's narrative buttons that it hit. All right, so uh, there was that movie with Harrison Ford, uh, Patriot Games. And so, you're not going to remember that fucking movie, all right? But, uh, uh, but to say it as quickly as I fucking can, one of the things about it, is uh, there's these IRA guys who are going to do something uh, in front of Big Ben in England, and they're going to attack the beef eaters or something like that. And uh, uh, Harrison Ford just happens to be there and happens to uh, 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 stop it. And then there's two brothers, Sean Bean being one of the brothers. There's two brothers that are part of these IRA guys, and then they kill. Uh, Harrison Ford ends up killing one of his brothers. But the Sean Bean gets away. Now, Sean Bean, like, swears revenge against Harrison Ford's Jack Ryan character. Now, the problem that I have with the movie is, okay, you understand that why Harrison Ford did what he did, but actually, at the beginning of the movie, you understand why the IRA guys are, are doing what they're doing. It's, you know, they're IRA guys, you know, they get you, you, you understand it. And you really understand why the Sean Bean character wants to kill Harrison Ford. Oh, yeah, well, you, not only did you fuck up our plan, not only did you fuck up our big raid, you fucking killed my brother. You, it's none of your fucking business, you stupid fucking American, you know? Uh, um, You know, so it's understandable his his vendetta that he has. But then they turn around and then he kills somebody else and then he kills somebody else and now they start selling that he's a psychopath. And I didn't fucking buy he's a psychopath. I bought him as a serious terrorist with an agenda but for the political reason. And just the fact that the villain was just this much understandable That was too much. The fact that you could relate to his situation was too, too much as far as the filmmakers were concerned. So they had to make him a crazy and they had to have him kill a bunch of people and act like a crazy person. And that's what I got morally offended by. Euh, donc, euh, alors là, j'ai un, un, un problème avec un film, pas d'un point de vue moral. <laughs> Mais scénaristique, donc c'est le film Patriot Games, je crois que c'est Jeu de pouvoir, euh, 
à confirmer. Mais donc, euh, ce sont des, voilà, des, des, des terroristes de l'Irak qui doivent faire un attentat à Big Ben et Harrison Ford, son personnage, est là pour les arrêter. Et il tue donc le personnage qui est le frère de, du personnage incarné par Sean Bean, qui ensuite veut se venger contre lui et qui a tué son frère. On comprend pourquoi euh, Harrison Ford veut arrêter l'attentat, euh, mais aussi on comprend pourquoi euh, l'Ira a les motivations qu'elle a et euh, on, on comprend pourquoi Sean Bean veut tuer Harrison Ford, qui a tué son frère, et lui dit Ça te regarde pas, espèce de sale con de Ricain, mène-toi de tes affaires. Euh, et donc, euh, mais ensuite, le film passe dans un, dans un, un stade où euh, le tueur, euh, on le fait passer pour un psychopathe, alors que c'est un terroriste qui a des motivations politiques. Et euh, le méchant, donc le fait que le méchant soit aussi compréhensible, visiblement, a posé un problème au cinéaste. Euh, et donc, il a fallu le rendre euh, fou, euh, en faire un tueur fou furieux. Ça m'amène au chapitre central de Cinema Speculation. Euh, qui est euh, si Taxi Driver avait été réalisé par Brian De Palma. Mmh. Euh, C'est un donc, chapitre important puisque le, 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 le chapitre est aussi sous-titré Cinema Speculation, donc le titre du livre. Euh, dans ce chapitre-là, vous faites l'hypothèse que euh, c'est Brian De Palma qui réalise le film à la place de Martin Scorsese. Bon, L'anecdote veut que en fait, Schrader a, a proposé à De Palma euh, le script de Taxi Driver avant de le proposer à Scorsese, qui en fait l'a fait sur la suggestion de De Palma. Euh, et vous, vous, la, la, la conclusion du chapitre est de dire que euh, Brian De Palma aurait fait un autre film que celui de Scorsese parce que un cinéaste a lui aussi une certaine forme de responsabilité. À savoir, enfin, vous faites deux hypothèses. Euh, D'une part, vous dites que De Palma n'aurait jamais cédé au studio pour le personnage interprété dans le film de Scorsese par Kettel, ce personnage de sport, puisque c'est un Mac, et normalement dans, la, dans les années 70 à New York, un tel rôle aurait dû être interprété par un noir, comme dans le script de Schrader. Et par ailleurs, vous dites que De Palma n'aurait jamais épousé le point de vue de Travis Bickle, il aurait fait un thriller beaucoup plus politique, euh, beaucoup plus paranoïaque, comme euh, il avait l'habitude de le faire. J'en reviens donc à ma question. Quelle est, selon vous, si on peut appeler ça une erreur, l'erreur la plus importante de Scorsese Est-ce que c'était de céder au studio ou est-ce que c'était de trahir la réalité des années 70 En d'autres termes, est-ce que pour vous, un cinéaste a une responsabilité vis-à-vis -vis de la représentation de la société So in your chapter, uh, what if Brian De Palma had directed Taxi Driver um, you, um say that uh, Brian De Palma never would have given in to the studio to hire a white actor for the part of sport because the pimp could not be uh, white at the time and he had to be black, and that De Palma wouldn't have embraced Travis Bickle's point of view, but would have shown the character's madness and turned the film into a paranoid thriller. Uh, so do you consider that Scorsese's big, biggest mistake is giving in to the, was giving in to the studio or betraying the reality of the 70s? You've, you think that a filmmaker has a responsibility towards a certain social reality? No, I, I don't feel that because I, I think Taxi Driver is one of the best movies ever made. And uh, I, Taxi Driver without Harvey Cattell, I can't even fucking imagine that. I mean, I, I, I associate Harvey Cattell as much with Taxi Driver as I do with, uh, as I do Travis Bickle. I mean, it's just unthinkable without him. Um, so I do think Scorsese made the best version of the movie to be made. Nevertheless, part of the analysis wasn't talking about how good the movie is, even though I did say that. It was about being critical of the reasons why they made that choice. And I, you know, and the reasons belong to the producers, Michael and Julia Phillips, and the reasons belong to Columbia Pictures. Uh, And I think it's horseshit, all right, the, uh, the fact that they wanted to change, the, the, the fact that they were nervous that, uh, uh, that the Pym character and then the fuck hotel character gets shot at the end is black. Euh, non, en fait, je ne le pense pas, parce que pour moi, Taxi Driver est l'un des, des meilleurs films qui soit, et je ne peux pas l'imaginer sans Harvey Keitel euh, dedans. Euh, et euh, je pense que Scorsese fait vraiment la, la meilleure version possible de, de ce film. Mais mon analyse portait plus sur la, la, une critique de la raison du choix qui a été fait. Ce sont les producteurs, Michael et Julia Phillips, et la Columbia, qui en fait ont eu la frousse d'avoir ce personnage noir qui se fait tuer à la fin. And not only is it horseshit, their, 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 their reasoning... Um, they came up with a horseshit excuse. 
the excuse that they said, the reason what, that we're doing it, why we have to do it, is because, well, you know, we showed this in black audience, in black theaters, black audience, there's going to be, uh, 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 there could be riots, there could be violence, there could be violence in the theater. And if that were to happen, well, then the film will just get pulled. And then that's that. You know, and then that kind of, and that kind of violence did happen a few years later when it came to the Warriors, when the Warriors opened. Uh, um, and the, the, the film ended up getting pulled. All right. But I think that's a completely bullshit argument. I don't think that that was the case. As it's almost like Travis Pickle's own thinking that they think the uh, black audiences are so fragile that they uh, they couldn't stand uh, the, the bad guys being black. And it's also really crazy uh, because, okay, you know, uh, uh, you know, in '78. They have uh, everybody, uh, uh, every all the bad guys in uh, the deep are black. All right, you know, but apparently those Caribbean brothers and Columbia Pictures too. But those Caribbean brothers, they were okay. But you know, sport was was a sh bridge too far. I don't buy it. Um, no, the reason is the white people making the movie got really uncomfortable with the imagery, so they came up with a bullshit excuse to to cover their uncomfortability. Euh, et donc euh, non seulement je trouve que en fait, c'était un peu une décision merdique mais euh, je trouve que l'excuse qu'ils ont donnée était merdique également euh, qui est qu'ils avaient peur que dans le, le public il y ait euh, euh, des noirs qui soient choqués et que ça, ça mène à des émeutes et que le film soit retiré et point barre euh, et d'ailleurs c'est arrivé quelques années plus tard avec le film The Warriors euh, mais vraiment c'est pas une bonne raison parce qu'à l'époque il y avait quand même euh, pas mal de films où les méchants étaient des noirs et donc pourquoi d'un seul coup celui de le personnage de sport ce serait allé trop loin j'y crois euh, absolument pas le problème c'est que ces blancs qui faisaient des films étaient très mal à l'aise et ont donné vraiment une raison à la con pour justifier ça and that's what I call a social compromise and I'm against making social compromises in art yeah maybe people can handle it well too fucking bad all right You do it, and maybe these audiences won't understand it, can't handle it, but maybe other audiences down the line can, or maybe they can, and that's just, the, that's just where you are. Now, having said all that, and this is not me trying to be a nice guy to Martin Scorsese, I do blame him the least of it. I don't think he was the one worrying about shit like that, other than them getting him nervous. I think, you know, they described a worst case scenario of him killing himself to make this movie and then it getting pulled from theaters. And frankly, that was a chance he was not willing to take. And I can understand that. I think they scared the shit out of him about it. But also, he really wanted a part for Harvey Cattell and there really wasn't one. And so that offered up an opportunity for him to stick Harvey in the movie. And then I, we were all better for it. So I, I, I do think it's more the Columbia executives and the producers. Et donc, c'est ce qui s'appelle un compromis social. Et moi, je n'accepte pas les compromis sociaux dans l'art. S'il y a des gens qui ne peuvent pas encaisser ce qu'ils voient, eh bien, tant pis pour eux. Mais d'autres sauront l'apprécier, il me semble. Et pour revenir à Scorsese, ce n'est pas juste pour être gentil avec lui, mais ce n'est vraiment pas du tout à lui que je jetterai la pierre. Euh, simplement, voilà, euh, ils n'ont pas voulu prendre le risque. Et comme Scorsese voulait sans doute euh, mettre Hervé Kaitel dans le film, eh bien, il a, il a dû bien trouver ce rôle-là et on s'en porte tous mieux, mais je pense que c'est la Columbia qui est fautive. Cependant, le chapitre trahit quand même votre amour absolu de Brian De Palma. Euh qui, je crois, voilà, le, le cinéaste qui est, le, qui, qui est, votre, qui est votre master. Euh, Est-ce que vous pourriez expliquer d'où vient cet amour pour Brian De Palma Quelle quel était le, la découverte, la, le, le déclenchement qui a fait que ce, ce cinéaste compte autant pour vous Quand on regarde vos films, on peut voir euh, évidemment peut-être beaucoup plus l'influence des cinéastes de Western Spaghetti, que ce soit Léon, Corbucci, etc. Peut-être De Palma est un tout petit peu moins évident. Donc, Est-ce que vous pouvez expliquer So can you tell us about uh, what triggered your love for Brian De Palma in his films? Uh, because in your films, we feel more the influence of uh, spaghetti Western uh, filmmakers like Leone or Corbucci. Uh, so tell us about De Palma. Well, again, you know, uh, um, me growing up and, and, and um, seeing Scorsese and George Lucas's and Francis Ford Coppola's and, and uh, Spielberg's and De Palma's movies growing up in the 70s before I even knew these guys' names. And then, now I'm a young man in the 80s, 
and now I, now I know all their names, and you know, and they're the great movie brat generation. They were the directors of our time. They were the exciting filmmakers, and there was you know, and there there was this even though they were getting older by the '80s, they were still had this youthful kind of energy about them. The whole kind of concept that they were all kind of friends amongst each other, and they all came from film school. It was you know, it was just it was just really really exciting, and um, I personally gravitated to De Palma for, I guess, a, 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 a various, various different reasons, I think. Uh, well, everybody likes Spielberg and everybody likes Scorsese, all right? Uh, and, so, you know, so I'm not going to sign up to the most popular dude in school. I'm not going to go after the most popular girl at the high school, all right? You know, uh, uh, that's not my thing, all right? So the fact that... Uh, yeah, but not only that, like people, there were people that, you know, back then, if you were a Cinetiste or whatever, the people who really didn't like De Palma, you weren't going to get into gigantic fights, arguments over uh, Scorsese. You weren't going to get into gigantic arguments over Spielberg. Maybe people being, you know, pissy about him, but not arguments. Now I'm like, oh no, the guy's a fucking rip-off artist, man. He's no fucking good. He just fucking steals everything from Hitchcock. He's a piece of shit. All right. <laughs> You know, and then like, no, no, you're the piece of shit, you know? And then I would like, this man, he's way fucking better than Hitchcock, you know? And then we would have, you know, and uh, part of loving De Palma back then was getting into fights about him and getting into arguments about him and practically getting into fist fights and defending him. Defending him was a thing, you know? But also one of the things that I liked about him uh, was, um, you know, I also think he's one of the great comedy directors, not so much his comedies, frankly, except for the early 60s ones, uh, but the satire and comedy inside of his thrillers, even inside of some of his action movies, is fucking hysterical. And he was, you know, and, and there, there's a satire, there's a satiric element about him. And then also just, you know, I, I loved his camera first approach to cinema. You know, he wasn't about, you know, shooting two people, uh, like a lot of my movies are Two people sitting around a table talking. All right, you know, uh, he he tries not to do that. Uh, you know, his was about taking the camera and, and 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 creating something, and and moving an audience, making sure an audience uh, uh, is responding to the images that are, that are going on. Et euh, donc, euh, j'ai regardé dans les années euh, 70-70, les films de Scorsese, Lucas, Coppola, Spielberg, avant même de connaître leur nom. Et quand je suis devenue ensuite un adulte qui connaissait donc, cette génération des, des movie brats, les, les sales gosses du cinéma, ils étaient assez en vogue. Et, mais, et même s'ils étaient déjà chevronnés, confirmés, ils avaient encore une énergie juvénile. Et euh, ils étaient amis, et ils venaient euh, tous d'écoles de cinéma. Euh, et moi, je me suis tournée euh, vers Brian De Palma parce que bah, tout le monde aime Spielberg et Scorsese. Et moi, je ne suis pas du genre à aller me, me mettre dans le rang des, des, des fans de, des, du, du mec le plus populaire, c'est pas vraiment mon genre et donc euh, il y avait beaucoup de gens qui n'aimaient pas du tout De Palma euh, alors que les autres ne faisaient pas, faisaient pas vraiment débat et euh, au propos de Palma c'était très violent, les gens disaient bah, il est naze il a tout pillé à Hitchcock, c'est vraiment une merde non c'est toi une merde, enfin voilà on se, vraiment, on se disputait, on se chamaillait, on en venait presque au point quand on parlait de, 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 de Palma et on, vraiment on se sentait une obligation de le défendre, moi ce que j'aime chez lui c'est que c'est un très bon réalisateur de comédie euh, mais euh, de comédie et de satire à l'intérieur de ses films d'action. Et j'aime aussi le fait qu'il rende la caméra très visible. Il n'est pas comme moi à filmer des gens autour d'une table. Vraiment, il crée en permanence et il veut émouvoir le public. Dernière question autour de, de, de la violence au cinéma, mais cette fois-ci dans vos films. Il euh, y a un motif récurrent dans, dans, dans votre cinéma qui est celui de le motif de la, de la revanche sur la réalité. Euh, dans Death Proof, la seconde partie du film, euh, le deuxième groupe de filles va d'une certaine manière venger le premier groupe qui s'est fait assassiner par le même psychopathe. Dans Inglourious Bastards, euh, c'est les soldats juifs qui vont prendre leur revanche et qui vont exécuter tous les nazis. Django, euh, pareil avec un, un cow-boy noir. Et dans Once Upon a Time, euh, on pourrait dire même que là, c'est le, le vieil Hollywood qui vient euh, sauver euh, le nouvel Hollywood. Euh, D'où vient chez vous cette envie d'une de, 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 certaine manière que le cinéma rachète la réalité 
So uh, to conclude on the question of uh, violence, uh, there's a recurring motif in your films uh, where the so characters take a revenge from reality. In Death Proof, the second group of girls kills the psychopath that killed the first group. In, uh, in uh, Inglourious Bastards, the Jewish soldiers kill the Nazis, same with Django, and uh, also in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. So where does this need to fix reality with revenge stories come from? You know, it's interesting, because in the case of... Um in Glorious Bastards, it wasn't like I thought I'm going to do this from the very, very beginning. I'm going to write a movie where I kill Hitler at the end. That wasn't the plan, all right? The uh, um, thing was, just I get the mission going, and then they're in the theater, and I'm sort of like, hey, this is kind of working out, all right? This is kind of working out better than I, I, I thought it was going to. I mean, they actually might be successful at this. I go, well, what the fuck am I going to do? All right, I don't want to do the thing where, oh, it's a double. All right, it's not the real Hitler. It's uh, some poor sh schnook, all right, that was acting as a double. And what, I'm going to have him get snuck out of the back of the theater? Fuck that shit. I ain't shooting that. All right. And so what I, what I did is, like, you know, Kurosawa would do this a lot, apparently on uh, um, Hidden Forest. He'd write himself into a corner. And then he would tell the writers to get him out of it. <laughs> okay, well, I had no writers to tell me get out of it. I had to get out of it myself. And I literally just wrote myself into a fucking corner. I wrote myself into a corner. Now what do I do? Now what happens? Um, and I'm like listening to music. It's like two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning. I'm listening to music. What the fuck am I gonna do? You know, I'm trying to think of different ideas, this and that. Nothing is satisfying. And then all of a sudden, the thought just came to me, just fucking kill him. <laughs> and I'm like, can I do that? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, of course I can do it. It's my story. I can do it for any fucking thing I want, you know? I don't know if it's a good idea, but I can do it, all right? Uh, I'm like, wow, really? Uh, wow. So I took a piece of paper, it was like three in the morning or something like that. I took a piece of paper and I just wrote on it, just fucking kill him. <laughs> and, and I laid it on my bedside table and I went to bed. And I figured when I got up the next morning, I'd see that piece of paper and I would know whether or not it was a good idea. And when I woke up, I thought it was a good idea. <laughs> Alors, ce n'est pas vraiment un, un besoin, mais en tout cas, pour Inglorious Bastards, ça n'était pas prévu dès le départ, hein, cette fin. Mais simplement, à mesure que le, le, j'écrivais euh, cette mission, euh, je me disais, bah oui, ça se passe de mieux en mieux, cette mission, là, ils vont peut-être euh, réussir. Mais qu'est-ce que je vais faire Comment je vais finir ça Et je n'avais pas envie d'écrire une fin un peu foireuse où euh, c'était en fait une doublure d'Hitler qui se faufile hors du théâtre. Euh, et je me suis dit, bon, qu'est-ce que je fais euh, J'écoutais de la musique à 2h du matin et puis rien de satisfaisant ne me venait. Et puis, d'un seul coup, je me suis dit, il euh, y, y a une petite voix en moi qui m'a dit, mais vas-y, bute-le. Et puis l'autre petite voix a dit, ah bon, mais c'est vrai, j'ai le droit, je peux. Et puis l'autre petite voix, bah, oui, en fait, c'est mon histoire, je fais ce que je veux. Donc, euh, je n'étais pas sûre que c'était une bonne idée, mais en tout cas, j'ai pris une feuille, j'ai écrit sur la feuille, bute-le, putain. <rire> et je l'ai mis sur ma table de chevet et je me suis couchée en me disant que le lendemain, en me levant, je saurais si c'était une bonne idée ou pas. Et en me levant, le lendemain, je me suis dit que c'était une bonne idée. But now in the case of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, that's a different story. That one, like the reason I wrote the whole fucking story was uh, to save Sharon and to kill those motherfuckers. <laughs> to have them go to the wrong house and like really the wrong house. <laughs> Euh, mais par contre, pour Once Upon a Time euh, in Hollywood, c'est très différent parce que la raison pour laquelle j'ai écrit ce film, c'était pour sauver euh, Sharon Tate et qu'il bute ses enfoirés et qu'en euh, en fait, il se trompe vraiment de maison et qu'il bute ses enfoirés. Il y a un film qui traverse euh, tout le livre « Cinema Speculation » comme une espèce de, de matrice euh, du nouvel Hollywood que Schrader a beaucoup écrit et réécrit, c'est La prisonnière du désert de John Ford. Vous citez beaucoup le film, 
euh, en, a, en, en, en montrant, en démontrant son importance et son influence sur le cinéma américain qui va alors apparaître. Mais j'ai l'impression que vous ne mentionnez jamais véritablement votre, votre opinion autour de ce film. Donc je voulais vous demander qu'est-ce que vous pensez de La prisonnière du désert et plus largement, qu'est-ce que vous pensez du cinéma de John Ford John Ford's The Searchers is a Matrix film for the movie Brass Generation. Schrader, in particular, drew from it many times to write his scripts. You mention this film a lot in your book, but you never give your opinion on it. So could you tell us what you think of The Searchers? And more generally, can you tell us about John Ford's film, what you think of them? Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's, a, that's, that's a good question, because for years, I didn't like The Searchers. For years, I, I, I didn't appreciate it. Uh, I didn't like Jeffrey. I, I always liked uh, John Wayne's performance in it, and I even liked John Wayne's racist son of a bitch character. All right, but I didn't like Jeff. I, I didn't like Jeffrey Hunter in it. I, 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 I just didn't get it. it was like a lot of fifties melodramas of, uh, of West that I just don't like, frankly. And um, so I've just I've never I had never understood the high pedestal that John Milius and uh, Spielberg and Scorsese and Schrader have always put that movie up to. I mean, it's actually interesting, the, the biggest Fordian of them all is uh, uh, Peter Bogdanovich. And he likes The Searchers, but he doesn't like it like those guys do, you know? He, he, he spreads it out a little bit more. Um, I'll let you euh, alors, c'est une bonne question parce que pendant des années, c'est un film que je n'ai pas aimé. J'ai toujours aimé la performance de la prestation de John Wayne dedans, qui joue vraiment ce, ce connard raciste, mais je n'aimais pas Jeffrey Hunter et je trouvais que c'était un peu ce genre de mélo des années 50 que j'appréciais pas énormément. Et j'ai jamais compris le piédestal sur lequel des euh, cinéastes comme Mil John Milius, euh, Spielberg, Scorsese et Schrader mettaient le film, et même Bogdanovich, en fait, l'aimait bien ce film. But then in writing the book. I figured I should watch The Searchers again because I hadn't seen it in quite a long time. I thought I sh uh, should watch the film again just to uh, bone up on the stories and some of the connections that I'm making between the other movies. And lo and behold, this time I liked it. It was a thing where like this, this time I, I kind of got it. I'm still not as into it as these guys are, all right? Um, But I see a little bit more where Scorsese is talking about, especially when it comes to the character, but especially his breakdown of Ethan Edwards that I, I recite a couple of times. A man who had a great love in him that got stomped out of him. Uh, a man who fought, a, uh, uh, who, went, who went, went away to fight a war that he lost. Um, and I have to say, I did find the community of these white characters, that is what this is about, white manifest destiny, all right? Uh, but I did find them sort of touching, actually. And uh, the, the rituals that they hold on to, 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 to make themselves human, to hold on to a version of civilization, you know, in, in, in this wilderness, those little square dances that they go to, and everyone kind of knows their spot in it. This is something they took from another place. And I mean, it's quite similar to the deer hunter, at the beginning of the Deer Hunter, the way they, they take these, this, this Russian Catholic Orthodox uh, uh, a community and stick it in the middle of Pennsylvania and try to m make it a, a, like nothing's changed. Uh, I, found, I, I, I did find that moving, actually. Uh, I found Ward Bond moving in it. And it was, the, it was those community of characters that I, I did find moving. I'm still a little more on Scar's side than I am on uh, Jeffrey Hunter and... Uh, and Ethan Edwards' side, and I do not buy that uh, uh, Natalie Wood's Debbie would go back with him. I think, no, she's married to Scar, she's there. Uh, and I do wish John Wayne had killed her, <laughs> because that's what he was supposed to do, you know, uh, uh, because of this life not worth living defilement by this native, all right? Uh, but that is his character. Uh, so I don't, like it, I, I don't like it wimping out at the end. Uh, Uh, but nevertheless, I did find it moving in a way that I, I was always tone deaf to. Et en écrivant le livre Cinéma Spéculation, euh, je me suis dit que je devrais sans doute revoir ce film euh, pour pouvoir faire justement tous ces liens euh, avec tous ces cinéastes et faire ces recoupements. Et euh, de façon incroyable, à ma grande surprise, cette fois-ci, je l'ai aimé. J'ai un peu compris, alors même si je suis moins fan hein, que ces autres cinéastes, euh, j'ai compris en fait ce que Scorsese disait sur la beauté de ce personnage de Ethan Edwards, de son effondrement euh, à cause de cette, cet amour perdu et de cette guerre perdue. Et euh, j'ai aussi été touchée par euh, cette communauté qui sont bon, donc des blancs 
blanc, donc du, du manifeste blanc, qui garde une sorte de, de, de civilisation dans ce, ce, ce monde sauvage, ces terres sauvages, et le fait qu'ils fassent du quadrille, une structure où chacun a sa place, et qu'ils aient importé cette culture-là d'ailleurs, un petit peu comme dans Voyage au bout de l'enfer, où on met ce, cet orthodoxe russe qui donc, importe dans une, dans, dans la, en Pennsylvanie comme si rien n'avait changé. Je trouve que c'est assez touchant, même si en fait, je ne suis toujours pas du côté des, des personnages et de, de Jeffrey Hunter, par exemple, et que j'aurais voulu que John Wayne tue le personnage de Natalie Wood. J'aime pas qu'il se dégonfle à la fin, mais il y a quand même des choses que j'aime bien dans le film. And, you know, uh I'm more appreciative of where John Ford was coming from than I had been before. You know, I, in interviews, was like talking about canceling John Ford before people were talking about being canceled and uh, for, their, for their past work. And I realized that that's kind of an asshole thing to do. And uh, you cannot like something. You can find something uh, 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 troubling uh, from a different time period But that's just the way it is, and that's that movie. And, uh, you know, so like, for instance, yeah, do I have a problem with Henry Fonda's uh, genocidal uh, uh, Colonel Thursday at the end of Fort Apache being given absolution by John Wayne at the end for his just, you know, you know for his fucking, he's, he's a, you know, he's a genocidal massacrist, all right? Uh, not only does John Ford And not only does John Wayne give him absolution, the movie seems to give him absolution. Uh, and he, they do it, and, you know, and, and, they, and they, you know, do it for, you know, esprit de corps, <laughs> all right, uh, more than anything else. But it's also for white people, too, at the end of the day. I, I cannot sign up to that ending, and I cannot like that, that ending. But that's probably a pretty fair representation because I don't think anybody questioned that ending. At least no white people questioned that ending when that movie came out in the 40s. And so that gives you a glimpse of where people were coming from. That is a realistic statement uh, because I don't think there was a lot of protest about it. And I don't think there was a lot of second guessing about it. So that was letting you know where people were coming from at a certain, at, at a certain time. So that doesn't need to go in the junk, junk, uh, uh, the, the garbage pail. That needs to be examined. Et donc, euh, moi, je, voilà, à une époque, il y a eu vraiment une cabale contre John Ford où on voulait euh, voilà, le, le, le rayer de la carte avant que ce soit, voilà, qu'il y ait la, la, cette, cette culture, cette cancel culture. Mais en tout cas, on on peut ne pas aimer et on peut trouver problématique avec le recul de certains de ces films. Euh, par exemple, dans Le Massacre de Fort Apache, oui, j'ai un problème avec le fait que le personnage d'Henri Fonda soit totalement absous à la fin euh, par John Wayne et aussi un peu par le film, on, on dirait, par un peu pur esprit de corps, de corporatisme. Euh, et, mais aussi, voilà, c'est un film qui est fait euh, par, par des Blancs pour des Blancs et je ne peux pas adhérer à cette fin. Mais il faut reconnaître que c'était une représentation sans doute fidèle euh, de, de, de la mentalité de l'époque, de la sortie dans les années euh, 40. Il euh, n'y a pas eu de protestation à ma connaissance à la sortie du film. Donc ça dit quelque chose d'un état d'esprit et euh, plutôt que de tout jeter, on devrait plutôt euh, l'étudier. And to say that John Ford is on Henry Fonda's side is me being disingenuous. He obviously is sickened by this character. The movie has a tone against the character. The movie is obviously on John Wayne's side. So that's even me being disingenuous, you know, of, of, about applying blame to John Ford. I still, the ending still bothers me, though. But now I find it fascinating that it bothers me. Et donc, je suis un petit peu injuste quand même parce que de dire que John Ford est du côté d'Henri Fonda, mais, mais ça me gêne quand même, mais c'est assez fascinant que ça me gêne. Alors, le temps a passé vite. J'avais encore énormément de questions, mais donc du coup, je vais peut-être en poser une dernière. Je vais revenir à la critique. Euh, ce qui est assez étonnant, quand on, on regarde euh, rétrospectivement votre cinéma aujourd'hui, c'est que le premier film, Reservoir Dogs, euh, qu'on a évoqué en, en introduction, la toute première scène du film, c'est plusieurs types autour d'une table qui discutent d'une chanson, Like a Virgin, et qui passent leur temps à l'interpréter. Et le dernier à prendre la parole, c'est Mr. Brown, c'est-à-dire vous, euh, qui, don, qui, qui, do, qui donnait un petit peu l'interprétation finale euh, de la chanson. 
Donc, le film, c'est comme si Reservoir Dogs commençait déjà comme un film de critique qui euh, discutait autour d'une table de la chanson ou du film qu'il venait de voir. Et euh, c'est vous qui euh, avez le, le dernier mot. Alors, je fais un pont, euh, du coup, peut-être un peu rapide, mais pour quelle raison votre dixième film sera autour d'un critique de cinéma So, in your very first film, the very first scene is a critical debate about the signification, the meaning of Madonna's Like a Virgin. And you, Mr. Brown, give the final interpretation. Um, uh, you have the last word. So, why, for your tenth film, are you choosing to also have a critic as the main character? No, oh, well, that's a long story. I can't tell you guys until you see the... So you see the movie, you know? Uh, um. I'm feeling pretty good with this microphone in my hand. I'm tempted to do some of the characters' monologues right here, right now, but I'm not going to. 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 <laughs> but I'm tempted. I'm tempted. I'm tempted. You guys would get a kick out of it. All right. Maybe if there was less video cameras here. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, um, yeah, you, you'll just have to, you'll just have to wait and see. You just have to wait and see. Alors euh, oui, c'est c'est une longue histoire, hein, et puis en plus elle est en cours. To be continued. <rire> elle est en train de d'être de s'écrire, donc euh, et comme je me sens bien avec ce micro, j'ai presque envie de vous citer, de vous jouer des monologues du film, euh, mais euh, en fait il faudra attendre avant de voir, donc à suivre. To be continued. Un grand merci, Quentin Tarantino. Ah. Merci. Et bravo, Anaïs, pour la traduction. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming out. You guys were a great audience. I've seen Rolling Thunder quite a few times, but this is one of the best audiences I've ever seen it with. Thanks a lot. Vous êtes le meilleur public qui ait regardé avec moi Légitime Violence. Merci.